Welcome to the AI Decision Guy podcast, the show where we explore the intriguing balance between artificial intelligence and human decision making. I'm your host, Dr. Carlos Kemeny, and in each episode, we dive deep into the world of AI and its impact on various industries. Dr. Ennis Hoschker is an engineer by training and an AI entrepreneur by trade, driven to unlock scientific and technological breakthroughs, having built AI products and companies over the last 10 years in high compliance environments. After selling his first machine learning company based on his doctoral work at Carnegie Mellon University, he joined a digital surgery company named Care Syntax to found and lead its machine learning division. He's currently the CEO and founder of Gazund AI. He's a former Fulbright Scholar at the University of Texas at Austin and has been the author of several published scientific works found in peer-reviewed journals. Okay, well, it's great to be here today with you. And I have a special guest, um, a good friend of mine, someone who I really admire, somebody that I look up to. And, you know, we have a, a good history together. Um, going back, I think, over a decade. But I have Ennis with me, and uh, what a pleasure it is. You know, he's a brilliant person um, and a, a phenomenal person uh, uh, to, to, to know, but just a kind-hearted person and somebody who's brilliant. So welcome, Ennis. It's good to have you. Thank you so much, Carlos. Really happy to be here today. Well, I, you know, one of the things that really was exciting to me about the work that you're doing, and we're just going to jump in, but is uh, the timeliness of, you know, the the this medical AI uh, decision making and regulation, and you've started Gazund. I'd love to hear as a start to our conversation what brought you into medical AI. How did you land here? What were the things that appealed to it? And uh, uh, yeah, if you could dig into that. Sure. Uh, so, uh, you, you know, parts of this personally, but maybe not uh, in detail, the latest bit, but you know that uh, I've been building AI products and companies in highly regulated environments for over a decade. Uh, my first venture was in the uh, electric domain, electric utility domain, uh, which is a lot more conservative than the healthcare domain, if you can believe that. I mean, I tell this to my healthcare colleagues, they're blown away. I'm like, that. there's a more conservative industry out there? Well, yes, there is. And that is the utility space. Um, and, and as far as why I landed in, in, in medical AI, I mean, so my first uh, company got acquired uh, late 2018. And I've always had this affinity to uh, healthcare uh, coming from my uh, family of physicians, uh, my late father, uh, my sister, my wife. Um, I'm, I'm surrounded by physicians and, and I grew up in hospitals as a kid. So I guess um, uh, I was drawn to that for personal reasons, but also when I was looking at the field of medical AI back in you know 2017, 2018, um, you know medical AI was quite hot at that point. You know deep learning applied to medical imaging. As Seisha, I even considered building a uh, imaging AI company, which was the hot thing uh, back in 2017. I didn't. I, I figured it was a too crowded space. But then ultimately I. Um, joined a med tech company uh, in the digital surgery domain to uh, lead their AI transformation, which showed the, the ins and outs that what it takes to build a, a, an AI division and AI product line in the medical domain, you know, trying to bring together the, these different ingredients in highly, you know, uh, regulated, highly sensitive environments. And um, so, and my, my latest venture gives is is, I guess, the culmination of all, all those experiences from different ventures, the different observation points. And, and I am building this company because we've been long stuck in the era of toy algorithms, talking about the medical domain, toy algorithms based on toy data sets that might be good for a nature publication. And you know, obviously in the nature is a, uh, a highly respectable outlet uh, of, of uh, uh, scientific uh, thinking. That being said, when it comes to real-world applications and deployment and value creation, uh, we have a long way to go. So we, we, I figured we got to invest in the infrastructure to make this all happen. And and how uh, did I come to that conclusion? And I, I think this will resonate with you as well, as an AI practitioner. You know, uh, you know, people that like to throw around analogies. You know, data is the new new oil, right? Uh, and 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 I, I have a nuanced appreciation of that 
uh, analogy because I did come from the oil and gas space, as you know, before I switched to electricity. So data is the new oil, electricity is the new AI, uh, sorry, AI is the new electricity. Um, and I also have a very, you know, a, a granular appreciation of what that might mean. But if that, those are the analogies, if AI is the new electricity, uh, who is building the electric grid? Uh, thus far, nobody has been. And if I'm going to continue on that analogy, uh, if AI is a new electricity, then uh, what we are today in medical AI is, you know, people walk around with a handheld lantern that is gas operated, gasoline operated, and that only allows for, uh, you know, visibility to their immediate, you know, uh, uh, surroundings. So nothing about the grid, nothing, it's just, you know, uh, commune operated, you know, uh, lighting, so to say. Uh, and in order for us to turn medical AI into utility, we got to invest in the infrastructure in a compliant ML native way. And that's why uh, I'm building my latest company. Phenomenal. I mean, I think that one of the things that really appeals to me about the work that you're doing at Gazund um, is actually manifest in an article that you uh, recently uh, worked on. Um, four types of bias in medical AI are running under the FDA's radar. And I love this uh, and the way that you approach this because it points to an important aspect of decision-making in the medical space, which was how do you regulate AI? What, 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 are the, what are the things that a regulator should be thinking about? How do you create good policy and regulation? Clearly you have a background in this, clearly you have a company that you've been thoughtful about this, but can you dig into the impetus behind this article and mm -hmm. talk a little bit about how does a decision maker make decisions on regulation around AI, which seems to be changing every second of the day? Yep. No, thank you for that. Um, so the existing regulatory mechanisms from the FDA or, it, or its you know counterparts across the world uh, in Europe and elsewhere, um, we're not used to thinking about uh, you know evaluating AI, understanding AI, or, um, uh, or, or, or living with or using it. And uh, these groups typically come from, understandably so, from a uh, drug and device background. Uh, but AI is a new beast altogether, right? You know, uh, you know AI uh, is not a, you know, pacemaker. Uh, pacemaker, you know, or any other, you know, medical equipment, uh, they're more predictable. They're more, you know, auditable. Uh, they're more predictable, you know, in the sense that um, they, their applicability and utility does not vary tremendously across use cases or geographies or patient groups or uh, the environment in which they are deployed. Long story short, AI is it needs to be deal, dealt with in a in a way that is novel and that is not like what how devices and drugs have been dealt with. And the main issue there is generalizability and reproducibility. And there's a, you know, a, a uh, ever-growing amount of evidence coming from the scientific literature showing that, you know, you can build an algorithm, um, but showing that it works in a robust, safe, effective, and equitable manner, it, it's not as straightforward. And so therefore, you know, in the, the, the piece that I penned uh, with a colleague of mine from Memorial Sloan Kettering, a a senior radiologist and professor uh, was that this is highly variable and we got to tame the beast that is AI. We got to introduce some guardrails that don't require for these stakeholders to be, you know, computer science PhDs because for a very long time, data science has been done by data scientists for other data scientists and the process of developing algorithms as well as their outcome, how, it's been quite opaque. You know, physicians are not readily equipped to understand how these predictions are made or, you know, or pop the hood, so to say, to understand if and how those algorithms and their predictions might be applicable to their day-to-day -day workflow. That's, that's been, you know, one of the key things that we need to appreciate as not just the regulatory bodies, but also, you know, medical stakeholders, including physicians, health systems, as well as technology developers come from drugs and devices and, and other technology groups. So how do we create a common denominator that does not require for everybody to be a computer science PhD that can be that can allow for the stakeholder readily inspect and for their own use case with their own local conditions and data 
to, to create that layer of trustworthiness because many people have been developing algorithms. And as of today, the FDA has cleared north of 500 AI ML enabled products and thousands are in the making. We'll see a deluge of algorithms seeking market entry, regulatory clearance and training, retraining, testing, validation, deployment, monitoring, the whole, the whole life cycle approach. So therefore we gotta be careful with how the world evolves with the rest and how the population evolves with the uh, with the rest uh, with the rest of the ecosystem, and, and so therefore we got to be more hands on as to how AI behaves because at the end of the day we're talking about human lives, and so we got to equip with the uh, the stakeholders the right guardrails with the right tools for them to inspect uh, the the performance of these algorithms when they are deemed necessary. I mean, if you think about it, these inspections have been around for a long time. If AI is if AI is new electricity. Don't you think you know the electric grid has guardrails every inch of the grid? It does. So we have to develop the same you know a, a mindset and the life cycle oriented appreciation of how we should keep tabs on AI performance over time and space. I like this a lot because you talk about trust. Um, what an important element of decision making. Um, in fact, I was at a recent summit for McKinsey, um, and we were talking. Uh, one of the attendees and myself about the challenge that the FDA has with uh, defining the boundaries, the boundary conditions of regulation around AI models. Particularly, we talked about the specifics around information that's presented back to potential patients, um, diagnoses versus prescriptions. And clearly, ChatGPT has shown the generative nature, I think, in many different types of use cases. But there's a lot of danger, potentially, in putting in open-ended uh, framework around uh, prescription. And so we talked about the regulatory aspects of this. The challenge is that once you've verified a specific model, data is continually coming in to feed those models. And so things can change. And so how do you then create an iterative uh, live approach towards relevant data? Um, and I think that this is one of the things that appeals to me about Gazund a lot is how you're approaching uh, data in a way in the clinical space for the entire life cycle. But how do you apply that then generally to AI uh, medicine? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so... Sure enough, we are trying to contribute to the conversation of what some of the best practices ought to be. Everybody has opinions uh, that we're not, we're not, we don't have a shortage of opinions in, in how uh, a medical AI uh, should be developed or, or uh, validated. And that is great, right? You know, everybody's quite vocal, academics, you know, regulators, uh, physicians, health systems, policymakers, et cetera, et cetera. But you have to put things in perspective on what the use cases are, what the you know the the uh, the user uh, thinks, and what they use this piece of information for. Uh, what they, in other words, uh, accuracy and performance, and, and which which are you know the the foundation blocks of trustworthiness. They're very subjective terms. Depends on the use case, the best alternative um, source of information. How timely it can be, how accurate it can be, how how costly it can be, uh, how readily digestible it can be. So in other words, you know there are all these multiple dimensions uh, that you have to um, uh, bring into perspective, and and you can use the example of maybe you know an, an AI uh, solution is great for you know um, general practitioners who don't have they have direct access to a radiologist, you know, in, in a practical manner. Now that being said. Maybe a attending senior radiologist shouldn't be using it in the same way or thinking about the guardrails in the same way, right? So for that reason, you know, the risk is also in the eye of the beholder. Um, what are their best alternatives? What are their workflows? What are the, the plethora of, you know, considerations that they have to deal with? And make that transparent to everybody, everybody else at the table, not just to their own um, uh, utility, but everybody else. How do you communicate that uh, in a, a relevant and, and transparent manner? That's been missing because, you know, technologists, physicians, and regulators, they speak very different languages. They have very different expectations. So therefore, at the very least, as a company, we're trying to reduce that technology barrier 
you know, how do you create an environment, a low code, no code environment that allows for physicians to readily inspect algorithm equity instead of relying on an army of data engineers and data scientists. So that's one layer. It's not the only layer, but ultimately we have to reconcile all, the, all these different stakeholders um, in a way that uh, they appreciate each other's risks and, and, and account for these risks as, as far as how they touch their own circles as well. I think that's a great approach, you know, ultimately increasing observability, uh, allowing for transparency, uh, you know, all important aspects of trust, you know, it, it, maybe shifting a little bit to the, um, the way that we deal with that first AI misdiagnosis, um, where something's passed through the FDA. Um, clearly this is part an important part of the regulation. Maybe as a parallel, we look at the first accident with a self-driving Tesla. And clearly these things are still now in the courts and understanding who's liable. Uh, there's some learnings there though. Um, how do we apply that? What, what are the ways that we learn from the car into medical AI for some of these. And I think the argument, I remember being at Google X with uh, Sebastian Thrun and they had done one of the early, you know, he had led one of the early, I think it was carcinoma and evaluating moles and did a, a, a incredible study showing how machine learning uh, can diagnose very well and can supplement and augment maybe not the best doctor and provide excellent uh, supplemental augmentative uh, skill um, for diagnosing carcinoma. So when you look at now from a regulatory standpoint, how do we learn from these things to augment, uh, but also from a legal regulatory framework, how do you embed some of these learnings to prevent maybe a backlash that we almost would expect when, even though you've maybe saved a tremendous amount of lives and there's just one, there's still one and they're still removing that decision-making power from the human, which clearly is worse, but how do you deal with that in a public domain? Well, that, that, that's a fascinating question. So I guess one, one key statement I, I'll make is test early and test often. Um, don't take a snapshot of an algorithm and expect it to, to uh, uh, survive for years or decades like their device counterparts. And even with devices, we know equity is an important uh, topic. You know, to, to share one example, uh, I don't know if you recall this, but pulse oximeter, uh, the, 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 the controversy around that was that uh, African-American women uh, or just African-Americans in general, uh, pulse oximeter accuracy is not the best design for darker skin, meaning it has led to suboptimal outcomes for patients. And similar similarities are emerging in medical AI as well. In the same vein, African-American women have denser breasts as do Jewish women, you know, of, the, uh, of that ethnic origin, meaning an algorithm trained for less dense breast anatomy won't exactly, you know, uh, diagnose in a comparable way for these patient cohorts, sub patient groups. So for that reason, you know, just, uh, you know, highlighting the equity topic and, and how different patient groups with respect to age, gender, race, or, you know, other diseases, comorbidities, as we call it in medicine, you have to be granular. You have to be granular as to how you test algorithm trustworthiness across these patient groups so, so that, you know, you're confident in its robustness uh, in an equitable fashion. And do, again, do this early, do this granularly, do this in a thorough way, but do this also often because like you said earlier, AI keeps evolving and you want AI to keep evolve, right? You know, to uh, to make better predictions, you know, uh, to, to cater to more uh, powerful use cases. And so, so, so that it can learn from its mistakes and equip these stakeholders in, in more meaningful ways. So, so we wanna learn from our mistakes. We wanna understand our gaps. That's uh, that's what we do as a company too. So so we got to equip these stakeholders with tools that they can readily and quickly and iteratively inspect where the gaps are and and quickly fill those gaps because we you know we're not in the business of 
stifling, stifling innovation. We're in the business of learning from our mistakes to create the next generation of algorithms. But ultimately, to, to your point, uh, false predictions will be made because this is, you know, AI. False uh, judgment has been, you know, uh, uh, rendered uh, by uh, human experts in the past. And then, you know, policymakers, I will assume, again, uh, this is not my expertise, but uh, you and I are both sensitized to that world through our uh, academic training. It will it'll, it'll require a population level consideration. What are the pros and cons? You know, who is benefiting from this? Who is uh, paying more dearly for this? And ultimately, if you can show that net net, uh, the, the American population or the, or the global population can benefit in a you know, significant manner, then I think many policymakers will be drawn to the benefits and, and the utility of AI. But we got to do the, you know, the calculus intelligently. We got to understand, you know, you know, what are the costs? Who's paying those costs? When and, and how? And who is benefiting from it? And, and then we can intelligently decide, okay, now we are benefiting from this as a society or we're not. But we haven't done that uh, calculus just yet. Makes sense. I, let's talk a little bit about the, the, the patient themselves and the decision of the patient. You know, I think that what you're talking about instills trust in decision-making from patients as well. It's not just policy. It's not just, you know, considering all these stakeholders, but can we talk very quickly about, and I wish we had a few hours, right, to talk about this, but what are the things that are going through the minds of patients as new technologies are coming out, new drugs, um, new devices are coming by virtue, uh, by, by a product, um of ai what is this what is the transformation that's happening in the decision maker uh the being the patient in adopting um some of these solutions mm -hmm. yeah that, that that's a you know uh fascinating era because uh humans are not strangers to using technology uh in a whole variety of different areas um and uh so therefore uh, so long as we can enable these humans these decision makers as to how you know reliable and accurate these sets of information are then i think humans will, will be able to make a decision for themselves but we can't just expect them to be experts you know, uh, and left to their own devices to navigate these topics. You know, policymakers and other stakeholders have to step in and say, okay, and explain how these uh, algorithms work and how predictions work and how labeled they are. And some of the efforts that we've seen, um, and, you know, FDA, you know, using that example, we have the nutrition labels on uh, foods, right? So that's a very basic way for uh, an everyday, everyday person to look at a, in everyday good and say okay this is good for me or bad for me you know um, as a person i have gluten intolerance i try to check uh you know when i when i buy a, a good but you know but and I, but that allowed me for for uh, for me to make a decision for myself now we need a similar nutrition label and that's something in the works with uh, mayo clinic and others uh they're they're promoting a similar uh approach such that everyday patients can look at these predictions, these these um, the pieces of information, and see, okay, this is relevant to me, or maybe I should consult with my my you know family doctor, or maybe uh, I should be looking at other sources. But ultimately, we can't just expect them to just rely on uh, the, the this AI generated insights uh, independently. Yeah, I think uh, you know there, there's so much embedded in how we make decisions around the adoption of technology. Um, and at the same time, it feels natural. And maybe as a final question, you know, I, you know, uh, for our conversation today, you know, what are you most excited about with regards to how this adoption will play out? Um, certainly, the speed of innovation is going to bring incredible technologies, um, incredible uh, solutions to solve patient health issues. Um, so maybe talk about the things you're most excited about. And the things you're most concerned about with regards to AI and trust in the medical uh, industry. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm let, let me start with the the more pessimistic approach. What am I concerned about? Uh, algorithms being developed in 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 isolation. 
you know, mostly scientists, technical people building the algorithms, not necessarily knowing how these algorithms in their raw form or in their product form, which is a different, you know, uh, version of the algorithm in actual clinical workflow, right? You know, how is this being used? You know, design thinking, in other words, right? How does my user benefit from my technology? You have to walk there, you know, uh, uh, walk in their shoes to understand and appreciate the the, the, the gaps and then the roadblocks and, and the, the opportunities. So what I'm concerned about is that in, in particular in medical AI, these end users, i.e. physicians for the most part, and sometimes also patients themselves, unless these AI developers really adopt that design thinking, we could generate suboptimal and you know inequitable outcomes that could yet create another AI winter. Because AI winters emerged because AI could not deliver in some of these promises it has made over the years. And medical AI is one of the fields where it's, where it's a lot more uh, complex to build something robust and meaningful compare, compared to other areas where data access with respect to privacy, security, and other compliance issues are not a, of, of, a, a, of, of strong consideration, you know, in this less than regulated industry, so to say. Um, so my, my, my biggest, biggest concern is that, you know, these other key stakeholders are not included in the development cycles and develop, uh, deployment and evaluation cycles. And what, is, what excites me most, and that's also why I'm building a Gesund, is medicine can be personalized deeply. And in medicine in its traditional form is not personalized. It's based on very small clinical trial based on some hundreds of patients who might have nothing to do with you personally. And they also report that. They quantify you know, uh, the success rates of these drugs. And even in an you know, oncology drug works 1% of the time, you can document that, you quantify that, and, and, and you get it cleared. That's fine. And, and when your oncologist prescribes that drug to you, you know exactly you know, the likelihood of success. And more often than not, those drugs fail because you know, they have not been developed for you. Now, a compliant ML infrastructure connecting these data and AI stakeholders at scale, think of this electric grid. If you can build that, imagine all the medical data assets from imaging to electronic health records to clinical trials to laboratory results, essentially imagine all data sets connected, reconciled, longitudinally for all patients. And we are, you know, light years away from that, you know, reality. But if that reality materializes, then many scientific breakthroughs will be unlocked and human life quality as well as longevity will be greatly improved. So that that's the future I think we're working towards here as a community. Thank you, Ennis. Obviously, there's so much respect that I have for the work that you're doing. Um, and there's nobody better to to lead this. I, I, you know, as being part of the vital community that brings this to pass and that vision that you're talking about. Thank you for joining today. Thank you so much for having me, Carlos. That's great. Well, I, you know, if, uh, if folks want to learn more about Gazund, it's Gazund at, uh, or Gazund.ai. Right. And, um, you know, what a pleasure it was. So thank you again. And uh, we will uh, be excited about having you join again at some point in the near future. That'll be my pleasure, Carlos. Thanks so much. Thank you for joining us on the AI Decision Guy podcast. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review our show. And be sure to tune in to our future episodes as we continue to explore the ever-evolving landscape of AI and its impact on decision-making. Until next time.